What's going on, y'all? Robert Sykes, KetoSavage.com, and today I'm going to be diving into all of my top takeaways from this latest contest prep, this ketogenic contest prep. I'm going to be talking about my macro manipulations, my training manipulations, my mindset changes, just everything that really encompassed what I learned during this contest prep. This is going to be a little bit of a longer video, so buckle up and let's dive in. Let's start with the nutrition, the macro manipulations, and kind of what I've done in regard to that over the past 22 weeks. So as you know, I'm keto, obviously. This is a ketogenic contest prep. And I've been keto for the past five or six years, and the last two preps I've gone through have all been ketogenic-based preps. I'll talk a little bit later as to why I feel like ketogenic dieting is optimal over traditional dieting for a contest prep, but suffice it to say... I stuck with the ketogenic protocol the whole way through, both in my off-season, the contest prep, the peak week, and I'm going to be sticking with keto for the reverse diet portion as well. So with regard to keto, I had a very high fat uh, starting point. About 80% of my calories are coming from fat. I'm just going to dive in and show you what my spreadsheet looks like. I mapped all this out with regard to my weights, my macro manipulations, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So I'm just going to dive into that spreadsheet right now and kind of give you a good overview of what that looked like throughout the entirety of these 22 weeks. All right, so here is my spreadsheet for the contest prep. As you can see, I started at November on November 4th, 2019 at a body weight of 177.5 pounds. And my fat grams were starting at 305 grams. Protein was 155 and carbs were 20, and that's total carbs, 20 grams of total carbs, for a total of 3,445 calories. Now, if you look, that is 79.7% of my calories coming from fat. And I basically titrated fat down and protein up very gradually over the next several weeks until I reached my protein threshold. For me... Personally, my fat ratio was going down, 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 until I hit a low of what looks like 68.7% of my calories coming from fat, which is visible right here in week 10. At that point, my fat grams were 215, protein was 200, and total fat or total carbs was 20. So that's where I'm at there. I basically reached a height of 200 grams of protein during the course of this contest prep. Now, at that point, I started decreasing protein and also decreasing dietary fat, which resulted in an increasing fat ratio. So I started seeing an increase there. As you can see, those ratio numbers are going up, 71% of my calories coming from fat. Um, and as you can see, the total calories over here, for instance, in week 18, I just dropped below 2,000 calories. So I went from 2,020 down to 1,955 at about 71.4% of my calories coming from fat. Now here's something to take note of. In week 19, I introduced my first ketogenic caloric refeed. So my calories went from 1,878 to 2,538, of which... I saw an increase in dietary fat from 150 to 210, an increase in protein from 120 to 150, and my total carbs stayed about the same at 12 grams of total carbs. So that refeed looks like this. 74.5% of my total calories are coming from fat. Now, I had a refeed the following week, but this is when I introduced the two-day consecutive day refeed, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. But as you can see here, there was an increase in calories from the prior week's refeed, 215 fat, 140 protein, so a little bit of a drop in protein, 12 grams total carbs. And then the second day was an even more substantial increase in calories, 306, 168, 33 grams total carbs. Total carbs increased a little bit simply because my overall calories were increasing. I wasn't eating anything specifically higher in carbohydrates. Um, all right, so... Here we have the peak week, basically. So week 21, this is the peak week. The 28th here was the show day. Um, again, you can kind of see my total weight here, 166.4. So I've dropped just over 10 pounds. Um, and there was an increase in calories on the first day of the refeed from 1780, which is the lowest I got, 
to 2,580, all the way up to 3,546 on the day prior to the photo shoot um, or the competition based off of the base of the concept is whether it's a photo shoot or a competition, this would hold true. So now this is the reverse that here, I'll save that for another video, but I really want to show kind of some of these, these spreadsheets here or these pie charts. So as you can see, the weekly macros are resulting in increase in dietary fat ratio. So here during the peak week, 76.2% of my calories were coming from fat. On the refeeds, 77.7% of my calories were coming from fat. So a very high fat ratio relative to traditional bodybuilding uh, standards. Now, I want to show you these spreadsheets or these charts here. So this is a chart of my weight. Again, a very gradual drop in weight. And then you'll kind of see a little bit of an increase here towards the end where I started introducing more calories with those refeeds and filling out just a little bit. Now, this is the main chart I want to show you. So here is the legend. Kind of get an idea what these colors look like here. The dark blue is the weight. The dark red is the weight goal. That's kind of an arbitrary number. The fat is yellow, so keep that in mind. The protein is green. Keep that in mind. Purple is carbs. Keep that in mind. So as you can see in the beginning... The uh, everything is going down here except the protein, which is green. The protein is increasing. So I'm increasing my dietary protein intake on a daily basis until I reach this protein threshold, which for me was the 200 grams. That's when my protein peaked. From there, protein started declining, fat started declining, and overall macros were dropping. The whole time, overall calories were dropping because the fat has higher caloric intake per gram than protein. So the whole time, the calories were dropping. Now, obviously, carbs stayed very low this entire time. I went from 20, then dropped down to 15, and then towards the end here, I dropped all the way down to 12 total carbs. Now, here's where you see these spikes. This is from the keto caloric refeed days, um, where you can see a relevant spike in both protein and fat. A slight bump in total carbs simply because I'm eating more calories. Um, so that the 50, that was from the day after the competition. That was not from the peak week. This massive bolus was what I kind of estimated to eat right after the competition or the day after the competition. So that's not too relevant here. And these are for the refeeds going into the reverse diet. So don't pay attention to that. Basically look at everything to the left of this massive spike here. So you can see... I've got an increase in fat, increase in protein, both days, slight bump in dietary carbs, but only 33 grams of total carbs. So I'm not using carbs to fill out and peak for a competition like traditional bodybuilding diets suggest. So no need for that. The main thing I want to illustrate here is the increasing protein to find a protein threshold, and then that drops. Dietary fat stays high throughout dietary fat ratio stays high throughout. And that's a pretty good overview of what a typical contest prep from a macro standpoint looks like for me. Now, there's two things that I want to make a note of with regard to what I kind of manipulated with regard to the macros and the food. Uh, as far as the food goes, I kept it pretty simple. I recommend keeping it pretty simple. My macros change every single week. And as such, I change my meals every single week, but I make a very small, slight change. So you saw the meals throughout the whole documentation process. Mostly they were comprised of, you know, eggs, ground beef, some organ meats, stuff like that that's easy to tweak. And I'll just prep it all, or Crystal would prep it all for the whole, for the whole week while my macros were set the way they were. And then I would just add an egg, remove an ounce of ground beef, something like that so I could stay consistent with it. Two things that I'm very proud of. One, I ate an entire keto brick every single day of this contest prep. This is why I'm proud of the keto brick. It was never made to be a product. It was made for my own personal benefit when I started bodybuilding from a ketogenic perspective in 2015 and then competed in 2017. The keto brick is not a snack bar. It is a performance bar. You won't find me eating snack bars during a contest prep because they don't warrant the nutritional value and density that I look for when I'm trying to optimize performance. The Keto Brick does. This is not a sales pitch on the Keto Brick. This is just something that I use, plus it makes manipulating my macros incredibly easy and efficient. I can have a Keto Brick, 
which is going to offer the high dietary fat, and then I can adjust the protein sources, whatever I need to, based off what my macros are. So I feel really good about that. It's kind of validated the fact that this is a performance product. My, my performance only improved throughout the whole entirety of the prep, and I'm proud to say that I ate an entire brick every single day of that prep. The other thing I'm proud of is that I ate venison that I killed every single day of the prep. Obviously, you don't have to do that. You don't have to eat a brick every day either. But those are two things I'm very proud of. The product that I've made and the deer that I've killed were what fueled me every single day of this contest prep. So pretty pretty cool if you ask me. Um, all right, so I want to talk a little bit about training because a lot of questions are surrounding training as it relates to a contest prep. I honestly did not change my training that much. From what it was in the off season to what it was in the contest prep, I started tracking my training so that I can get a good solid baseline as to what my rep scheme was, what my total intensity was, my, what my weights lifted were, so that when I went into that contest prep, I can try and maintain and build upon that. And I'm happy to say that I was able to hit PRs throughout the entirety of the contest prep as well. I did not see a massive drop off in strength, which is pretty typical of bodybuilders, especially natural bodybuilders, as their calories start to drop. So I didn't notice any of that. I definitely started to get more tired towards the end, uh, and it's harder to push yourself when calories are low, but I did not see a massive drop off or decline in strength throughout the whole prep, and I kept it simple. Another thing I'm really proud of is that we worked out, Crystal and I worked out and trained with the gym that we have here at the compound over the whole course of the contest prep. There's very basic equipment. I have dumbbells, I have barbells, so free weights, I have resistance bands, and I have a simple little cable setup that's got you know just the basics on it. Leg extension, um, hamstring curl, pull, pull downs, and some basic cables. Nothing fancy, no crazy lying leg hamstring curls, nothing that's exotic that you see in all these big box gyms. And I was able to increase my strength increase my muscle density, increase my overall shape from what it was in my last competition, all using equipment that I have here at the comp. Now, I know that not everybody has all the stuff that I have at their home gym, but the main point I'm trying to make here is you don't need all the fancy top-of-the-line stuff in order to see progress and improvement. I was incredibly pleased with my improvement in muscular shape and, sim shape and symmetry using just the basic primitive equipment that we have. So, Take note of that. With regard to cardio, I typically use and recommend the Stairmaster. That's easy to track and manipulate. However, due to the coronavirus, the gyms all got closed uh, about halfway through the contest prep, or not quite halfway through, towards the end of the contest prep. But that's when my cardio really starts to ramp up. So my main form of cardio that I typically use and recommend was taken away from me. Um, I don't have a Stairmaster in the gym here. So what I've done and what I had done the entire prep leading up to that point was I would go on a daily run. The run wasn't so much used as a cardio source, more so as a way just for me to meditate, for me to like find some peace, listen to an audio book, and relax. But I started to lean on that when the gyms closed down because that was my only source of cardio. But having a good consistent run, which for me was about 1.3 miles every single day at a pretty you know, not a crazy pace, just a nice leisurely pace, an enjoyable pace. That, to me, was my only form of cardio, really, throughout the whole course of this prep, and that did the job. So, super happy with that. There's no need to kill yourself on cardio day in, day out. I mean, my runs were like 10 minutes long, um, or less than 7 minutes long, 7 to 12 minutes, depending on how long I would go. So, you don't need to spend hours and hours doing cardio if you have your diet properly formulated and you're on top of your training. So no need to kill yourself on the, on the treadmill. So another thing I want to talk about is the peak week itself. And this was the first year I'd ever implemented the two-day consecutive refeeds. I was incredibly pleased with how that turned out. I didn't know what to expect. Um, in the past, I had not filled out like I would like to on show day. I noticed that I would come into the pre-judging show a little bit flat. And then by the end of the day, I would fill out and look much better. So my, my theory was that by, by having a fat source on Thursday, an increase in calories on Thursday, and then an even larger increase on Friday, especially Friday morning, the day before the show, then that would kind of like buffer myself and allow me to have enough time to truly fill out 
and let my body absorb those nutrients, soak them in, and make the most of them, especially since fats digest and absorb much more slowly than proteins and carbs. I felt like that was a necessary thing. And keep in mind, as the calories got lower, I was doing an OMAD approach, so a one meal a day approach, which is another crazy thing when you think about it. Most competitions or most uh, competitors, they're eating five, six, seven meals a day every two or three hours. So they're a slave to their meal frequency and their meal timing, whereas I was eating one meal a day, getting it over and done with, and then back to hustling and grinding and going about my day. So that's one major stark contrast between a ketogenic prep and a traditional prep. Now, with regard to the peaking, this was not the show. The March 28th event was not the show that I was in, intending to peak for. I was intending to peak for a show in April the 18th, so I was about three weeks shy of that. Based off of how I looked at the photo shoot on Mar on March 28th, I feel like I was right on target to peak for that April 18th show. So I feel like my timing was good there. And honestly, I, I can't really say that I would change anything. I think having those um, calories the where they were, having the ratios where they were, and then kind of implementing those two-day consecutive refeeds was working really, really well for me. The main thing to keep in mind with regard to the peak week is to be on top of your sodium intake, your hydration, and kind of track these variables and be as consistent as you can with them so you're not introducing a whole bunch of new variables. If you have a very well-formulated ketogenic diet and you're dialed in and you're well-adapted, there's no reason to add a whole bunch of crazy new variables in during peak week. All right, so I want to talk about the results of all of this right now. So as you know, the competitions all got canceled, so I couldn't really showcase what I'd built from a competitive standpoint against other bodybuilders on a stage. That's why I opted to do this photo shoot, and I'll get those photos to you as soon as I get them myself. But for me, it was a, I mean, that was kind of a, a bittersweet effect, and I'll kind of go into to that in a little bit. But the, the competitions were canceled. I had to kind of optimize and peak for this photo shoot, but I treated that as it were the competition and changed everything accordingly um, and stuck with it accordingly. So happy with how that turned out. Um, I want to talk about the total weight change. So I was 177.5, I believe, when I started, which was the 4th of November in 2019. 21, 22 weeks later, I'm coming in at 166. Uh, 0.4, I want to say is what it was, 166.5. So not a huge drop in weight. It is in incredibly important to not start a contest prep having to drop down 50 pounds or more. There's no need for that. You're going to lose a ton of lean muscle tissue if you have to diet that aggressively. Start at a very lean standpoint to begin with. Like I started, I've got some notes here. I went from... 9.81% on the caliper test at the beginning, down to 4.72% via the caliper test at the end. And then during peak week, I went up a little bit because I was filling out a little bit more. So that registered me at 5.37%. Um, I got a DEXA scan at the beginning. I could not get a DEXA scan at the end due to the virus. So I don't have that data for you. But the whole point being, I only lost about 11 pounds over the course of the entire contest prep. Make sure you're staying at a lean, healthy, fit body composition in your offseason. There's no reason to balloon up and put on a bunch of body fat. There's no reason for that. Uh, you're not going to see an increase in lean muscle tissue during the, the offseason if you're just fat and obese. So stay healthy year-round, and then you don't have to lose and diet near as hard during a competition prep. So that would be my huge takeaway advice there. And then... Uh, track all this, you know, have all this information, have all this data. I also got blood work done prior to starting the contest prep. And again, due to the virus, I was not able to get some final blood work done. However, a company called letsgetchecked.com just reached out to me and they sent me some samples. Um, so I signed up and I ordered a bunch of hormonal blood tests. I ordered a uh, complete male testosterone hormone panel a thyroid panel, cholesterol panel, and a few others, I believe. And I got all those tests done on Wednesday of last week. So just a few days post-competition. And I'm going to get those results back and share those with you as soon as I get them back. So I should be able to have a pretty good accurate comparison for what my blood work or how my blood work was impacted as a result of the change in calories, macros, and just the overall intensity of the competition prep. 
And I'm incredibly excited to share that with you because my theory is that by being in a ketogenic state, my hormones, uh, my hormones are, are much healthier over the course of a contest prep than they would be had I followed a traditional bro dieting approach, which was very low in dietary fat. So I will get those results to you as soon as I get them myself. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is after the show is all said and done, you've got your, your post-show moment. So basically after the finals and then that Sunday after the show. The shows are typically on Saturday, so you've got that Sunday kind of before you start a normal week again. This is the time in which most competitors just totally go off the rails. They eat anything. They eat everything. There is no discipline, no consistency, and it shows big time. This is what I've done in the past. I've, I've literally put on 20 pounds in 24 hours uh, in the past due to just obsessive eating that was uncalled for, unnecessary, and not warranted. And that was from a carbohydrate-based approach. Uh, so this is what I would recommend doing, and this is what I did this last competition. So I had the photo shoot on Saturday. I ate keto bricks so that I would not bloat. I had like a, those portions that I had like half a keto brick in the morning and then a fourth of a keto brick about an hour or two before I stepped on for the photo shoot, and that was pretty much it, that and some fatty coffee. That way I didn't bloat or feel overly full and I came in looking sharp because that helped fill me out a little bit more with the sodium, et cetera, et cetera. After the photo shoot was over, so after the competition was over, what I did was I went out and I ate, um, I had another coffee, fatty coffee. And then as you saw in that you know, final recap video, I ate a lot of food. I had a bunch of food that Crystal and I cooked. Um, I had, uh, what, did, what did I have? I had a big chaffle with some elk burger patties. I had a dessert keto waffle, and then later that evening I had a steak um, with my family. And then Sunday I had a big cookout with the crew, and I ate a bunch of uh, keto desserts and uh, steak, chicken wings, et cetera, et cetera. All of those foods are ketogenic. I did not eat a bunch of carbs. I had more total carbs simply a result, as a result of eating more total calories. I did not go off keto. I did not have to go off keto. I satisfied the cravings that I was having. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I focused on the camaraderie and the people that I was with because that's what it's all about in the first place. Do not eat like an ass after your competition. It's going to do many things, all of which are not good. It's going to have a negative impact on your relationship with food. You're going to start having this guilt trip. And it's going to be this yo-yo dieting approach to you know, feeling bad about eating those foods, and then starving yourself, and then relapsing, and then doing it all over again. There's some nuance to that, like it's going to affect different people differently. But at the end of the day, there's not going to be any good that comes from going against what you've done your entire prep thus far. Like if you've stayed keto during your contest prep, which I would recommend doing, it makes no sense to eat a bunch of carbs afterwards. You're going to feel sick. You're going to feel terrible. It's just not going to be worth it. And then stay within the reins and the limits of what makes sense. Like eat a bunch of food. Have that psychological break. You've been dieting forever. So it makes sense to enjoy some food for a change. Enjoy some variety. Enjoy the different textures. Enjoy enjoy all of that that is to be enjoyed. But don't let that become your world. Don't let the food rule your life. Don't put food on a pedestal. It is just food. Don't let it rule your life. And I'm going to talk about the reverse dieting and how to be structured with that in depth going forward. But that is what I would recommend for the day of and the day after your competition. Enjoy yourself. Keep it clean. Keep it keto. Have some dessert keto meals. But don't eat a bunch of carbs and, and recognize when you need to kind of tap the brakes and pull the reins in. Because a lot of psychological eating happens after a contest prep because you've been so limited for so long. Don't go off the rails. And then on Monday, the Monday after the show, have a plan, have a strategy. I'm going to talk to you about my plan and my strategy with my reverse diet series, but having a plan and a strategy and a course of action is going to keep you sane and keep you on target and on track. So definitely have that in order. So I want to talk about a couple bullet points that kind of compare the traditional bodybuilding prep versus a ketogenic contest prep, one of which is the total body weight necessary to lose, like I touched on earlier, you're going to have a lot more 
generally speaking, not all people, but generally speaking, you're going to have to have a lot more weight to lose because you're going to put on body fat easier. If you're eating a bunch of carbs, you're going to have more water weight that you're carrying around. You're going to have less of a accurate depiction of what your true composition is like if you're eating a bunch of crap carbs especially. So by staying keto in the off season and throughout the contest prep, you're going to have you're going to have much less total weight to lose generally speaking. That's been something that I've noticed and found within myself. Uh, I mean, my first contest prep, I lost 70 pounds, and that was just ridiculous because I lost a ton of lean tissue in the process. This contest prep, I lost 11 pounds, and I didn't lose any lean tissue. So I would definitely advocate going about it that way as opposed to the other way. Another thing that I noticed is that my relationship with food is better throughout. When you're eating a traditional bro dieting approach and you're having carbs as the primary you know, source of energy, your energy dips and tanks and spikes throughout the day as you're eating these meals. That's going to result in this fixation on those meals, and you're going to let those meals pretty much run your life. Uh, with me going into it this way, with a very low total carbohydrate approach, I didn't have those spikes in energy. I didn't have those dips in energy. Um, it was just consistent, even keel throughout the course of the entire day. I had one meal a day. I could enjoy that meal, make the most of that meal, be present in that meal, and then get back to living my life. So my energy was much more consistent. My lifestyle structure was much more sustainable. It's just a much different approach than a traditional bro diet, one that I would recommend over a bro diet for sure. Also, like I mentioned in the earlier section of this video, my strength stayed solid throughout the course of this contest prep. I was hitting PRs throughout the course of the contest prep. I never experienced that when I was eating a carbohydrate-based diet. Because my ketones were very high, because my protein was low, which is counter to most people's way of thinking, but because my protein was low and my dietary fat was high relative to my total calories, I was getting a deeper state of ketosis throughout the entire contest prep. Ketones are incredibly anti-catabolic. So I was able to hold on to the lean tissue I had built in the off-season much more efficiently and effectively than I would had I been eating very low dietary fat and very high carbs or super high protein. Like one of the misconceptions is that you have to have really high protein in a contest prep in order to hold on to muscle. That is not true. I have proved that time and time again. The contest prep I did in 2017, my protein got down to 67 grams. This contest prep, my protein got down to 100 grams, both well below my lean mass. I didn't lose any muscle. You don't have to have a ton of protein. Having a deeper state of ketosis allows you to hold on to muscle better so you can continue to hit PRs. And then when you start your reverse diet and you go back into an off-season, you're not having to make up for lost ground. You're already solid. Another main point that kind of contrasts the traditional diet from a ketogenic contest prep standpoint is that there's much less manipulation made during peak week. Like I said earlier when I was talking about peak week, I didn't have to do anything crazy with my sodium. I bumped it up a little bit on the refeed days. I didn't have to do anything crazy with my water. That is the main thing. If you're eating a bunch of carbohydrates and you get your, your numbers off and you rebound, you, you overhydrate, you underhydrate, you mess up your sodium, you can spill over and look like crap on show day. With the ketogenic approach, you just track things and you stay consistent with what you found to work up to that point. I literally had probably, I don't know, 50 or 60 ounces, maybe even 90 ounces of water in my system before I ever stepped on stage, before the photo shoot ever took place. Most competitors are just barely sipping water because they don't want to spill over. And then as a result, their electrolytes get out of balance and they start cramping up and they cannot perform. They can't hit the poses properly. Having proper hydration, proper sodium, proper electrolyte balance, and just a properly formulated ketogenic diet during peak week makes peak week so much easier and much more enjoyable. And then finally, to kind of wrap up the differences, I will just say that having a ketogenic off-season contest prep, peak week, and then post-show and reverse diet all-inclusive is so much more enjoyable and sustainable and that's just the fact of the matter. Like, that's not even, I can say that's an opinion, and I guess that is technically an opinion, but I've done it both ways. I've talked with people that have done it both ways. I've talked with so many competitors that come out of a show, eat a bunch of carbs, blow up the next day, and just feel trapped and have this very negative relationship with food. 
I don't have to worry with that near the ex to the extent that I would had I been eating carbs this whole time. So I would argue that having a traditional bro dieting bodybuilding approach to your nutrition is just very, very much so inferior to the benefits that I'm seeing with the ketogenic contest prep. And this is literally what I've been preaching for the past five or six years because I've done both. I've seen the light at the end of the tunnel. I've experienced what's possible. And I just encourage people to do that and to trust the process and know that you can excel as a natural bodybuilding athlete with a ketogenic protocol. You can build muscle. I mean, I literally came in 10 pounds heavier than I did during my last contest prep. And that was solid muscle. Like I feel, look, and perform much better. And you can too. All right, so I'm going to wrap this whole video up. I know it's been a long video this far, but I want to wrap this whole video up. And I want to talk about the mindset takeaways that have come from this contest prep. So this is the most important aspect of a contest prep. This is what I yearn for. This is why I compete in the first place. I learn more about myself during those last few weeks and months when the contest prep gets really hard than I do in years of it just being like easy and normal. Like you learn, you grow, you adapt, you evolve, you push yourself, you become better during times of adversity. And the same is true with this prep as it is with every contest prep. So I've got a couple takeaways I want to dive into there. Um, first of which, this whole virus obviously threw things off. The coronavirus rocked my world as it's rocked many when it comes to your plans, your intentions, and your goals and aspirations. So because of the virus, as you all know, all the competitions got canceled. However, when I went into this competition prep in the first place, I had a mission, so to, so to speak. There was a couple things that I wanted to accomplish. And I feel like I was, I was able to accomplish all of those things in spite of the virus happening. So one thing I illustrated was how to build muscle and that it's possible to build muscle with a ketogenic diet. Like I said earlier, I came in about 10 pounds heavier than I did in 2017. And when you're that lean like you are during the peak week, you can see where that weight actually is. You can see the changes in your muscular shape, symmetry, definition, density, and my legs got bigger, my hamstrings particularly got bigger, my quads got bigger, my back was more developed, my chest was one of the, the biggest changes I'd seen looking back at pictures in 2017, my chest has gotten a lot more developed. So there's no doubt in my mind you can put on quality lean muscle tissue following a strict ketogenic diet because that is all I've done for the past five or six years. I have not broken that ketogenic state and I have obviously put on quality lean muscle mass. So I'm very excited and happy to have been able to illustrate that. Secondly, I wanted to illustrate that it's possible and preferred and optimal to lean down using a strict ketogenic protocol. There's this weird conception out there that that people have to eat carbs in order to lose body fat, or you can't eat a bunch of dietary fat if your primary goal is to lose body fat. I kept my dietary fat intake high throughout the entire course of this prep, and I lost body fat throughout the entire course of this prep, so I'm happy to have been able to illustrate that. I wanted to showcase that you can peak for a show, that you can manipulate a couple of things during peak week, such as the increase in calories, the increase in proteins and fats, the slight tweaks with the sodium, and just a few subtle changes to actually improve the way you look one day to the next, like on a 24-hour revolving basis. So many people think that you have to have a huge bolus of carbohydrates the night before the show to peak for the show. If you're a ketogenic athlete and you're prepping for a competition in a ketogenic state, don't listen to your coach if they tell you to eat a bunch of carbs the night before the show because they clearly don't know what they're talking about and don't know how ketogenic bodybuilding works. If your body's performed well thus far, don't throw in some crazy variable that you haven't tested, don't know how it's going to respond, and it's just totally different and start contrasting to what you've been doing and been working up to that point. If you've been keto, keep it keto, allow yourself to adapt and evolve and get strictly keto adapted, and then benefit from that. There's no reason to have the carbs as a variable. And then one of the main things I wanted to accomplish with this, with this prep is to beat the the shape, the conditioning, the look, the size that I had at the last competition. There are definitely competitors that you're up against on stage. I didn't get to have any competitors on the stage. But bodybuilding is an individual sport. I wanted to beat myself. If my 2017 bodybuilding self was you know, up against my 2020 bodybuilding uh, composition, 
which would win. In the eyes of the judges, who would win? And like I said, I didn't peak for this show, so I honestly think I was a little bit leaner in my 2017 physique because I did peak for that one. However, when I take into consideration the shape, symmetry, fullness, density, and just overall you know, increase in mass that I brought to this this year's contest prep with the fact that I also got pretty freaking lean, I truly think that the judges would vote in favor of my 2020 shape. I personally prefer my 2020 shape. So with that said, I feel like I've won in that regard. Like I beat what I had brought to the table previously, which is always my main goal. And then another thing that I really want to talk about is that, you know, in spite of all this virus happening, I feel like, you know, I definitely got down there for a second. Y'all saw the emotions in the prior videos. It's hard to to make make that into a positive. But I feel like, you know, that afforded me the opportunity to be a better leader for y'all, to be a better leader for my team, and to really test myself and afford me the opportunity to illustrate what's possible when I don't give up, when I don't give in, when I rise to the challenge, when I met with that adversity and beat it. I could have easily just given up and said, oh, the competitions aren't going to happen. Let's just throw in the towel and, and go back to eating like a slob. Although I never ate like a slob, but go in to just, you know, get all depressed. And I decided not to. I felt like, if anything, having the virus have the impact that it did gave me an opportunity that I would not have had had the virus never occurred. Yes, it's true. I never stepped on stage. But because of the virus, I had the opportunity to take a hardship that is affecting us all, whether you're a bodybuilder or not. I mean, no matter who you are or where you're at in, in the world and what your industry is, you've been impacted by this virus. And this was my way to take this this hardship, this adversity, this challenge, this obstacle, and make the most of it. And I feel like that's something I would not have had, you know, had it been another year, another season. So in that regard, I'm, I'm grateful that I had that opportunity. I'm obviously not happy that the virus happened but I feel like I truly made the most of it given the circumstances and the resources at my disposal so I'm, I'm proud of that and the last point that I want to make with regard to this entire competition prep series is that with regard to the mindset you know I was able to tap into this stillness that I have not had in quite some time I said earlier you know every time I go through a competition prep I learn more about myself I learn more about what I'm capable of, and then I'm able to adjust life, apply it to my day-to-day, -day, and improve accordingly. These last couple weeks the contest prep, when things were really looking bleak, when the virus reared its ugly head, when the competitions were canceled, when I found out that I couldn't spend time with my family, when all this negativity came seeping into my life, I was able to just truly find a stillness this sense of meditation, this sense of being, the sense of purpose that I haven't felt or experienced in quite some time. I've experienced it during prior competitions. I've experienced it when I started the business and I was $250,000 in credit card debt or $250,000 in debt and I had to bootstrap it and make it into what it is today. I've experienced this before when Crystal and I have been on the rocks during the early years of our relationship. And I've experienced it now with the hardships that this prep brought to me. Having that stillness and learning from it and tapping into it and recognizing and appreciating who I am, what I stand for, where I'm going, what my purpose in life is, is so incredibly empowering. And I only tap into that when things are freaking hard. So I encourage you all to find things in life that are freaking hard. Seek them out. Use them. Leverage them. Make the most of them. Learn from them and benefit from them. If you do that, you become unstoppable and you get better and better and better. And that compounds over time until you have created something that you can be proud of, until you've created a legacy that you can hold your head high about and know that you're adding more value in this world than you're taking. So that is the recap of this 2020 keto competition prep series. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed it. I'm going to be diving into a reverse diet series going forward. I'm super excited to be sharing that information with y'all. So stay tuned for that. Until then, thank you all for everything. Thank you all for the support. I could not have done this without you. 
There were so many times when I wanted to give up, and then I thought about y'all, and y'all kept me going. So thank you. I love you, and I'll talk to you soon.